get him to dilate on his thoughts about the transformation that he wished would happen on our continent. Today's talk is called In Search of a Transformative Paradigm, Authenticity and the African Future. That is the theme for, for our three days. Today he will speak about the confused dream. And it will be, it will be, I will leave it for him to tell us what the dream, the confusion is and what the dream is. Right? So, with that said, I also thank him because he actually um, accepted to deliver this series of lectures with a very short notice. And we are very grateful that he could do, he could do so. I always tell him that he's, he's ever ready because he has dealt with these topics for a very long time. And so I knew he could, um, I'm, I'm very pleased that he, he could accept to do it today. So ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is Nana Kobina Nkesia the fifth of Mahini of Sikado, British Second D, traditional area. Nana Kobina Nkesia the fifth is a paramount chief of the Esikado traditional area in the western region of Ghana and serves as the president of the traditional council. A product of infant Spim school, he obtained his first degree in modern history from the University of Ghana and later earned a doctor of philosophy in African history from the University of Calabar in Nigeria. His areas of interest include Pan-Africanism, African culture and religion, governance, law and philosophy. He is the author of African Culture in Governance and Development, The Ghana Paradigm, 2013, published by Ghana University Press. Ghana Nketia has chaired many important organizations and committees, including the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, the Kwame Nkrumah Museum Governing Board, and he was a member of the Public and Emoluments Committee an honorary member of the Railway Workers Union. He has always been involved with the Global African Family Reunion International Council, a Pan-African Reparatory Justice Committee, committed body of chiefs, elders, and other indigenous African community leaders. The National Festival of Arts and Culture, NAFAC, the Public Utilities and Regulatory Commission, PURC, the Volta River Authority, and the African Regional Conference on Education and Cultural Heritage Development by UNESCO. He has been in recent times been outspoken on the ramification of illegal mining on the people and heritage of Ghana, and has spared no opportunity to join advocacy against Galamse. Ladies and gentlemen, your speaker. Please forgive me if I'm not good at protocols. Very, very good. I'm not good at protocols at all. See, when you're a chief, you're always being addressed. When you, have to, when you have to address other people, then you don't know what to say. So, the president of the academy. I hope I'm right. Okay. And I heard him say the secretary, honorary secretary or secretary, and then past presidents, fellows, members, See, sometimes I think that when you keep on with these protocols, you are wasting your life just, when you go to politics, let me introduce the assemblyman's dog. <laughs> and you ask yourself, your life, Mr. This, Mr. That, yeah, this, this. By the time they mention finishes the offices, 10 minutes are gone, of my life. But let me say that I also feel very awkward sitting up here. Not because of anything, because my roommate is sitting down there, and uh, me boy, <laughs> I hope your spirit is with me here. And then, of course, my very senior brother, Nana S.K.V. Asante. It's awkward that when we came in, he stood up 
I said, how, how can my senior brother stand up for me? No, no, for that one, I bow down to you too. And then I saw one of my special sons, Hamid, Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum. I'm happy that you did come. And then everybody, ah, Professor Dakwa. He used to keep me in his bedroom when I was very young at the University of Kalaba. Prof, it's nice to see you. And of course, the tidy boy, Professor Fiajo. You know, he will always be a guy. So it's nice to see you. But you know, my stream of consciousness for some years has been flowing on the theology of a frightening subject. Belong to, I say it belongs to the seventh dimension. A subject unwittingly, we call it chieftaincy. But it's not chieftaincy, it's beyond that. So it has given me to appreciate vibratory, vibratory frequencies, things like etching coffee, etching dazi. I'm sure most of you don't know the language I'm speaking. Etching coffee, so I have say, what is it? It has made me even delve into the quantum sciences and the spiritual energies, and also astral theology. And of course, the most interesting part of it, mathematics, and all of this to do with the subject, unfortunately, people refer to as chieftaincy. So let me, let me confess, Mr. President, that I feel very awkward standing here. Further, I also have a very acute awareness that to be African is to follow the path of my highly conscientious and truthful ancestors. But you all agree with me, for those who are Africans, that to be African in the current Africa is to live daily in a rage. Although I've been psychologically fighting to kill the white man in me, surviving as an African in Africa is challenging when the consciousness of nations is virtually being westernized. Tough. I remember it's not been me alone, SRB at Tanghuma, in his the Gold Coast National Nation and National Consciousness had alluded to the struggle of the African psyche. Therefore, when Professor Kofinti, after a panel discussion at the WEB Du Bois Center, asked me, but he's very, very soft-spoken, and the way he was even sweet-talking me here, can you imagine what he did there? To share my trivial thoughts through this august platform, I forgot to turn him down. I only asked him, can you talk to my senior blood brother, Nene Eskebi Asante? And I deliberately used that word, blood brother. If you're an African, you'll understand. He more than understands. Nene Eskebi brands me as a radical traditionalist. He said that about a decade ago, and I still can't understand that phrase. The fact that he's a Sante, and I'm a hunter, and yet we are blood brothers, led me to start re-examining our history and heritage from my indigenous worldview and social constructs. Distinguished guests, my conclusions have been astonishing. However, this is not the forum for elaboration. And ASKB's comment encouraged me to be here. After all, let me tell you, our blood relationship mandates us to look after each other's welfare. In our indigenous Akan faith and instruction, we should not harm, even harm each other's hair. Further, he's the one who made me aware that my hero, Kwame Nkrumah, has been reinstated to his rightful place in this academy. This has also won my admiration for the members of the academy. In a way, it sheds light on the role of consciousness, which I call the Anansi factor, a strand of thought that I'll make more of as this lecture pro progresses. Prof. Kofinti, and SKB. Thank you very much for importing me to stand nervously before this academy. For my stool in particular, for me to accept to present these memorial lectures in honor of Dr. J.B. Dankwa is an expression of gratitude. The part played by Dr. Dankwa's mother-in-law, Mrs. Varden, who is also a blood grandmother, with respect to my stool and my hunter heritage, doubles the humility and pleasure in being 
chosen as a very unconventional person. That's what Prof. Santi wanted to say, but he couldn't find the word to present these lectures. My predecessor as chief was known as S. E. Buduatha. He was the mainstay of a unit which the British referred to, uh, referred to as the ones who were producing seditious materials to raise mass consciousness for the release of the six members of the Gold Coast Educated Elite, detained and branded in Ghana's history as the Big Six. And that was inclusive of Dr. J.B. Dankwa. Fascinatingly, my predecessor earned the nickname of Goebbels, following the exploit of Joseph Goebbels, the mastermind of the propaganda machinery of the, of the German Ted Reich, the home in which a mass of these materials were produced, I understand, was where I was born. Among other things, I'm also very proud of Escado as the epicenter of Ghana's struggle for freedom. Whether we are free or not will be discussed at the end. We often tend to overlook Frederick Douglass's observation that power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. Uh, Frederick Douglass was an African-American ex-slave and did a lot in their place. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. I always find it embarrassing that Africans assume that Gerald Harlan Creasy, a colonial functionary whose mission, every colonial functionary here had a mission, and that was to ensure peace for the maximum exploitation of this territory for its principles. We tend to forget that. You think he came here for you? Never. So, uh, what do you call? To when he set up the Watson Commission, it was just as if he freely set it up. No. The youth of Second Itakrade, most especially those who lived in Escado, through the Gold Coast TUC, challenged the oppressors and prevented them from arresting the leader of the UGCC, George Alfred Grant and his deputy, R.S. Blay. It's a story most people don't know. They arrested five in Accra, arrested one in Cape Coast, and then the young, the young men, especially the railway men, told their general manager, if you touch these people, we are going to down tools. Simple. Or as probably by now we say, we'll let go the anchor. Further, led by Frank Wood, later he changed his name to Woodo. They threatened the strike if the six detained gentlemen were not released. This led to negotiations, which ended up with a firm promise of Creasy to have them released through the Watson Commission. They would have kept them, but the Gold Coast TUC, which then was based in Escado, was the one that confronted Creasy. And gradually, after a series of negotiations, they came to the castle, and he promised that we are going to release these people. Learn your history well. It is what will take you to your future. I find a lot of humor in the fact that the great George Grant generated a calendar of the big six with him, who had only undergone house detention, smack right in the center. Just again, I feel highly honored with a request to present these lectures. I'll say a few more things about my special relations with Dr. Dankwa as the topics go on, law and so on. As a matter of fact, I was delighted when I laid my hands on Danko's growing tribute to George Alfred Grant, that's Pa Grant, read in the, in the Wesley Methodist Church in 1956. His candid words, Demifa, George Alfred Grant, caused the Gold Coast African to rise above his limitations in politics. But he himself was more than a politician. He was a Moses the Moses of Ghana's independence. I find this very loaded statement etched in my heart. Unfortunately, we haven't unraveled this Moses and hardly hear Pa Grant. I was delighted he used that label. In fact, he talks a lot about Grant as Moses. But the humor that I find on the other side, I then understood why the CPP call Kwame Kwame Messiah. If Grant was Moses, then Kwame Kwame was a Messiah. And for me, my joy is that both of them come from my region. <laughs> and both of them give me inspiration. 
Coming from the formerly working class city of Skenitakrari, the only place in Africa with a circle named Worker Circle and another one as Positive Action Circle. Let now Skenitakrari is the seat of higher employment and social decay. And knowing the scratch of the efforts that the collective of that city made to defy the might of the British Empire. Dr. Dunk was very incisive assessment of Pagrant Grant makes it imperative for historians to do a better research and bring out inspiring accounts that will throw out the important role of the collective. Undoubtedly, if you do know your, if, if you do know your past, you will, you will accept and enshrine any Anansi stories. Only a fool learns his history from his enemy. The oppressed cannot be taught, uh, cannot teach history, the his cannot teach the oppressor, uh, cannot be taught by the oppressor his history. The West stories are narratives controlled from the system of exploitation and oppression. As a matter of fact, I get a kick out of the surprise people have. Any time I narrate the fact that, and uh, please listen carefully, especially the young ones, the railway workers swore the Nanak Kaur Bosmaba traditional African oath at a place called Impenton not to return to work till the British had agreed to hand over the reins of colonial, colonial administration to Africans and establish their dignity and rights, dignity, rights, and responsibilities as human beings. I also take a lot of emotional pride in having been, as you heard him say, in having been conferred with honorary membership of the once powerful but dying Ghana Railways Workers Union. The home and place in which I was born was where the Gold Coast TUC planned, not the Ghana TUC, Gold Coast TUC, planned, executed, and paid a high price for the great revolutionary defiance against the British Empire, adopt positive action. From that direction, I learned the meaning of a coup d'etat. Violence and arms only facilitate a fiscal or institutional takeover. The real coup is psychological. This may be sudden or this may be gradual. That is the intellectual coup d'etat. This fact became clear to me after the 66 toppling of Nkrumah. I went home for school holidays and found out that my predecessor's library, which was stocked with bound newspapers, you know, old papers, I remember some of them were written by Sechi and so on, magazines, books, Family files and notebooks, as a terror. And where I used to hide to read had been thoroughly cleaned out. In the street by the house, a worthy bonfire had been made of every piece of paper in that library for public viewing. The question was, when I asked why, I was told my very wise grandmother, who had suffered traumatic experiences and physical abuse in Ghana's struggle for independence, had been misinformed that her son, who left Africa in 65 on a UNESCO fellowship to study Africanisms in the diaspora, would not be permitted to return to Ghana if any paper was found in the house with Nkrumah's name. My grandmother was stuck illiterate. She simply wanted her son to return to her embrace, so the bonfire. Of course, I meant, as I mentally matured, that time I laughed. But as I mentally matured and became, began my fiscal deterioration, if you know Professor Tego, he used to know me very well. At that time, I didn't have gray hairs. But I, I couldn't even walk. I was shuffling to this place. I understood the book burning orgies in the University of Ghana, for example. And I've deeply appreciated Carter Woodson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro. And it's very thoughtful maxim. When you control a man's mind, you do not have to worry about his actions. Who and what is controlling the mind of Africa and why? What is the reality of Africa? Surveying the luxury, the luxury loving African leadership in various compartments of human, experience, human endeavor to the mind of Frederick Douglass of observation that I have found that to make, a, to make a contented slave, it is necessary to make a thoughtless one it is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision and, as far as possible, to annihilate the power of reason. 
He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. He must be made to feel that slavery is right, and he can be brought to that only when he ceases to be a man. Freddie Douglas again. Now I hope you understand my nervousness, Mr. President, in being here, and the fact that this is a very difficult lecture. In fact, I call this the most difficult lecture I'm doing in my lifetime. Because the academy is supposed to master the best brains in this African space, which we've branded Ghana. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say Ghana. I said African space, branded Ghana. Do these brains work for my liberation or to ensure my slavery? Then I escape you. You can imagine my fright in standing before you select professors of Ghana, i.e. the intellectual geniuses who have something to profess, to meditate on the existential interests, values, and well-view of Africans in this seemingly mad world. We are someone, I'm in trouble. So, as I was shuffling along, and I saw the young ones, some of them are wearing their disco shirts and so on. I, a disco used to be blue. I said, what is an insignificant person like me doing here? What or whose mindset is present in this hall listening to me? I used to tell my graduate students that all education is indoctrination. The best education is the indoctrination that makes you aware of indoctrination. What sources have indoctrinated the members of this academy? How authentically African is the mindset arrayed in this hall? Please, I plead mere culpa as I go on with this three-day talk. I did not call it a lecture. How can a person like me, immersed in learning the traditions of my people, lecture to professors? Please, squarely blame Professor Nt if I say anything here that is offensive. Owing to Africa's historical unidirectional links with the West, a large body of the sources of our indoctrination is from the institutions which have acted as construction agents of racism, as well as the foundation of scientific, judicial, social, political, and economic theories and myths which rationalize African subhumanism, primitivism, slavery, exploitation, colonialism, competition, wars, and oppression, among others. It is challenging deleting the epistemological psyche of such institutions from our state of being or our ontology. Remember that I said earlier, I'm trying to kill the white man in me, and he keeps coming up. And it's because of these sources that have indoctrinated me over time. As I look at you people, I feel sorry for you. I don't know whether you are being educated by Africans or people who think they are Africans. Such an awareness. I must say, inform the choice of the overall topic in search of a transformative paradigm. Authenticity in the African future. That I'm presenting in memory of a great Ghanaian intellectual, author, lawyer, and politician, among other things, Dr. Joseph Wache Dankwa. I also decided to focus generally on Africa. I would have loved to have done this space. But I'm sure you are all aware that to Zoom any talk on any subject in current Ghana attracts hyperpartisan garbage that sidelines the ob objective evaluation of one's thought produce. Partisanship thickens the fog of perception in, the, in these Berlin-generated countries. Anytime you see any African map, know that your ancestors didn't draw it. Some people start in Berlin and drew lines. Most people, in fact, I'll come, maybe I'll say this in my lecture, lecture. Most people are not even aware that 44 to 45% of the Akan are in, Goku, in Ivory Coast. They think that Akan is here. Some are here. The rest are in Cote d'Ivoire. You take the Eve, they stretch all the way from Ghana, going all the way to Nigeria. Among other relationships. So whenever I hear people talk, I'm Ghanaian, I'm Nigerian, I'm this, I start looking at them and start laughing. That accounts for my strict adherence to being African. 
These things cloud your holistic intellectual perception evaluation. African dualism, for example, is complementary. Western dualism is conflicting. As a candidate, the current president of Ghana, for example, made a succinct statement, get a cicado. And so, you all know it. We are seated on gold, yet we are famished. That is the synopsis of neo-colonialism or the framework of an economy structured by colonial thought throughout Africa. It's not unique to Ghana. This is the African state of affairs, which were restated 60 years after the first African country became independent. In Kuma, for example, in his I Speak of Freedom, wrote, the paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty and scarcity in the, in the midst of abundance. It is the elucida elucidation of Africa's neocolonial existence. When Muinye, Ali Hazan Muinye of United Tanzania, Republic of Tanzania, looked at Africa's resources, he said, we are being exploited for the sustenance of those who enslaved us and continue exploiting us. But the question is, was Muinye able to replace the exploitative framework in his own uh, African backyard as Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso are now spearheading I was listening to Traore just before I came, and he used a statement talking about this new colonial thing. He said, homeland or death. It's the same thing that was said in Haiti. You know, liberty or death. For me, an African, on the broader level, it's Africa or death. But are you dead Africans? Have you just been branded Africans? Or you are authentic Africans? We get to authenticity. As we go on. But in the religion of black power, a reverend minister in the state said, how shall we deal with an enemy who has more power than we do, who has long controlled and destroyed our lives that are even now more fully dependent on him, upon him than we dare confess? That enemy has been the source of African indoctrination. Of course, that enemy would would indoctrinate you to perceive him and his system, perceive him as a savior and his system as your salvation. His laws are the best in the world. His mind, I'm just provoking thought. Nothing more, that's what I do all the time. To appreciate the death of this dependency, pick up the curriculum of any tertiary institution, of the tertiary institution in most of Africa, for example and the extent of absorption and internalization of Western ideas become apparent. The students lose their core, their core of African value system. It creates political and economic de dependency, which in turn produces an unjust society. Thus the freedom to act in Africa's interest becomes incapacitated as African youth become rooted in Western ideas. The very sources of African subjugation and, dis and disempowerment as my roommate taught me in a very nice and positive way, catch them young and sh they shall be yours for, see they are saying it there, they shall be yours forever. Mr. President, everyone here knows that colonialism was, was not a fufu swallowing party. Every African who perceives the, selves, the self as well educated must have a deep and critical understanding of how colonialism converted the whole continent into a Western plantation and arranged African minds in its sole interest. Subjugation and acceptance. Once you be subjugated a people's mind, they become eternally yours. Rebellion and liberation arise only through self-realization, authenticity. Awareness of Africa's seeming inability to find a solution to our neo-colonial shackles makes a mockery of freedom of intellectual, of our, of our intellectual and leadership abilities. Mentally enslaved people cannot lead people into freedom. Mentally, mentally, Africa is still shackled by the West, whose historical objective has been to use, abuse, 
and misuse Africa in its interest. This derives our assumption of independence and sovereignty. How independent is Africa? When they even talk about sovereignty, but we'll get to this in part two, when we talk about the nightmare. A colonizer cannot educate you to freedom. Hence, we need to search for a transformative, holistic paradigm if Africa can claim to be independent. We, as Africans, cannot go on like this. Yabre. The man who enslaved you, you're still following him. You go to him for loans, you go to him for this. Abba Sama. A Rastafarian sage that I love put the African proverb in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. It's a proverb by our ancestors. The paradox of what? Poverty in the midst of plenty. Yet it's a Now comes in. It's the same thing. Malice reggae dirge encapsulates the antithesis of the communalistic and collective indigenous African socioeconomic ex uh, existence in the phrase rat race. One needs to study the ethology of rats to, to have a glimpse into Mali's summary. No matter how one turns it, from an indigenous African perspective of shared living, the capitalistic society is nothing more than a rat race. And what does he go? Oh, it's a disgrace to see the human race in a rat race, rat race. You got the horse race, you got the dog race, you got the human, but this is a rat race. This is 2024, Mr. President. And from my spectacles, my spectacles, so, Africa is still grappling with acute poverty, the satisfaction of people with regard to service delivery, forms of conflict, duplicitous and unprincipled leadership, blatant corruption and political abuse, injustice and unemployment. Added to this is a rise of diverse forms of escapist and materialistic religions or cults, which may possibly indicate of social stress and a form of psychological hopelessness. From where I sit, life in Africa, Mr. President, is very challenging. And what is worse is that we seem clueless as how to make a change. And the question is, now who or what caused them and why? Certainly, certainly, I'm very confident that if Dr. Danko were alive, he would have been preoccupied with Ayukoyama's question. How have we come to be mere mirrors, of an, mirrors to annihilation? For whom do we aspire to reflect our people's death? For whose entertainment shall we sing our agony and in what hopes? A lot of us don't even study Aikuyama again. This statement also reminds me of George Floyd's proverbial statement, I can't breathe. Africa can't breathe. Every African, and especially every member of this distinguished academy, must be preoccupied with that question. Who's, with the question that, whose or what foot is placed on Mother Africa's neck? And why has it been placed on her children so that her children can't breathe? We need to exhale. Please forgive me for saying this. And if Professor Dakwa is a member of this academy, you should please forgive me, he used to be my teacher. Mistakenly, Mistakenly, I had earlier envisaged this academy of consisting of men and women who belong to an exclu ex exclusive club of professors with nothing to profess for Africa. I unreasonably perceive the members of the academy as beaches for the perpetuation of the Eurocentric worldview and the transmutation of African culture. However, I was very lucky that quite recently I found Professor Yan Yewusi's funeral brochure which brought out the importance and vitality of this academy and its possibilities for Africa. And I said, ah, but if we have something like this here, this mind, you know, don't look at the building, no, it's a mind. Then who is thinking for Africa? Who are the authentic Africans thinking for Africa? Also, I show you that those thinking for Africa will be eliminated by those who want to control Africa. Let us recall Patrice Lumumba's words, dead or alive, free or in prison, it is not I myself who counts, it is the Congo, 
It is our people for whom independence has been transformed into a cage. Today, Lumumba's thought provokes every authentic African, and I pray it challenges the academy. As to quote Bob Marley again, he says, don't forget your history, nor your destiny. You know, it's a couplet. History and destiny has been the death of thought. Therein lies the importance, vitality, and challenges of this very special academy. I remember that I was in East Africa, learning their history. And the British could not get the fee the Nandi. And so what did they do? They invited them to a discussion. It was, please, come with five people, unarmed. We also bring in five people, unarmed. You know what the British did? They flooded the place with their soldiers. They hid them. The African trusted the British for his word because we are Africans. Your word is your honor. As soon as the five got there and they were greeting, the head of the guy, what's his name? Uh, Colonel, Colonel Minor Hagdenos, the British Colonel, just brought out a gun and shot the head of the dandy chiefs. Yes, brought him and shot him. And these people are your friends? You don't know what colonialism is about. You learn from these people, you don't know what colonialism is about. There is Nehanda in East Africa, a Shona woman, spirit uh, woman. And it got to a point they realized that what Rhodes was doing to them in Zimbabwe was wrong. So this woman led a fight. After resisting, they got her. You know what they did? They hanged her. But it's her words that I'll never forget. He says, you can kill me, but I'm pregnant. So the day you kill me, you hang me, more of me will be born. Are you Nehanda's children? Are you the grandchildren of Nehanda? So this is, this is the challenge. I could go on and on with these kind of stories, you know. But the academy is a very weighty place. And in fact, look at Prempe. The day I read Prempe's story as an African, I had tears in my eyes. How do you treat somebody like this? The promises you give, you won't burn Asante, Prempe is going to surrender. He finished and all that you did was to march him away. In whose interest? Go and interrogate the stories. The saddest part is that Prempe came back with his name changed to the son of Queen Victoria called Edward. You can imagine what they had done to his mind to pick up the head of the person who what, brought him, brought his face to the ground and to pick up the, the, the child, the, the, the name of his child. You are Africans. Go and interrogate yourselves. Your history is your power. And you have to learn the history of colonialism very well. Nobody came here to do your ancestors good. And unfortunately, I haven't used their language to talk. <laughs> Recently, I had the privilege of pointing out to some young people that Africa's vital natural resource, resources are not the presumed minerals generated from the bowels of the continent. The most precious resource is the African's head. Who and what controls it and how is it used? Is the African's head authentically African? There's, there's uh, an Indabele author, Mokokoma Okonwana, and he made a statement. He says, he wrote something, he says, if we had to earn our age by thinking for ourselves at least once a year, only a handful of people would reach adulthood. Because the, Greeks, the Greek establishment's awareness of the power of thinking, they killed Socrates, and they killed him legally by, for probing for uh, his, the probing of the, his mind probing into the Athens. Those of you who claim that you are, you are, you are Christians, whatever theology preached, you also realize that Christ was legally crucified for his nonconformist thoughts. The book of Proverbs, as a man thinks, so he see. Do Africans, do Africans Th do we think as Africans, sorry. In my own backyard, the Akan Kukwanansi 
serves as a symbolic commandment relating to the importance and use of the human head as a resource. Anansi contests dogmas. Kuku Anansi is curious and seemingly rebellious. He challenges and investigates established narratives. So one could confidently assert that Anansi is a conduit through which the Akan ancestors instruct the present with the maxim that one should never give his or her head to anyone and or one should always be in full possession of his or her intellect or consciousness. The worst mistake anybody can do is to have his enemy be the source of his, her, his or her indoctrination. Thus, much as I have strayed a bit, it is an absolute necessity for the academy to know that it should be a thought shield or brain trust for Ghana and Africa in this world, from which conscience and truth of, uh, in this world, from which conscience and truth had fled, in this world, in a world which hypocrisy, insincerity, and the augmenting of fried lies seem to assume intellectual orthodoxy, in a world within which every discipline and aspect of knowledge is becoming weaponized and geared towards domination, puppetry, exploitation, and extermination, in a world where the pursuit of wealth overrides all aspects of humanity, in a world where the reality of gender is contested, in a world that appears as an insane dimension, where those who appear as sane are guarded and treated by the insane, in a world where the preachers and purveyors of peace and equality openly practice luciferism, anarchism, and nihilism, as well as unmask the monstrous visage of evil in the form of the four Ds, deception, destitution, destruction, and death. In a world where the narcissist thieves and murderers, ruled by the spirit of greed, seek deification, within which the terrible role and effects of colonization, colonialism, and form of oppression have become glaringly so obvious, and yet the effects are boldly defended by the victims. In sum, let's look at Africa. We are still wallowing in the European dime, dime grime, I should say, dumped onto the continent through the obnoxious Berlin Hole. Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso are revealing the nature of the excreter swamping Africa. I saw a post on Quora saying, we live in a time where, intelligent, where intelligent, the intelligent are silenced so that the stupid will not be offended. Within such a world, ladies and gentlemen, an immoral and unconscionable world, a world of confusion and contested meanings, a world of psychopaths and sociopaths, I believe that, I believe that an academy of authentic Africans who profess from and of Africa has a primary duty of safeguarding this supreme resource in whatever subject necessary for the communality of Africa. You are the guardians of Africa's conscious, consciousness. An African thinks and manifests Africa. Prof, I'm sure you will all agree with me that one's fundamental identity of existence determines one's consciousness. If one lives in the African identity, then whatever enters the head and emanates from the head should be an animation of that African cultural identity. As uh, somebody says, your ear is your womb. Whatever you listen to, either good or bad, it conceived and will be given back to in due time and season. Choose what to listen to and what to ignore. No piece of information exists or emanates from a cultural vacuum. No piece of, invasion of information is culturally neutral. Every piece of information has a cultural mission. Therefore, the sources of any piece of information is critical for the proper use and benefit of the owners of this resource. In the wisdom of our ancestors, they say that the food that is not cooked on your mother's head, one does not go to learn how to eat it. That proverb gives an inkling into the role the academy has to play with regard to knowledge production. Besides ensuring the survival in our ecological space, the head works in the interest of the programming culture. That culture manifests one's identity. So as Kukwanansi represents, one's consciousness must never, never be given away to another culture to program, most especially the culture 
that you know is your enemy, unless you don't know. Do we think we're the head of our ancestors and what they know? Or we've cut our ancestors off? We are the new Africans. New in what? New in what? Whose ancestor's head guide you in your thinking? One's head must be used to discover, understand, and be applied to the African and its ecology in Africa's best interest, protection, survival, and future existence. Now, in Ghana, for example, the Asafu Creed, and I'm sure most of you don't even know the Asafu Creed, which was adopted by the UGCC. And I deliberately put this in because Dr. J.B. Danko was there and George Alfred Grant was there, Harris Blay, among others. He says, all for one and one for all. Now, we are living in a world where everybody cares for himself. What has happened to this Asafu Creed? Who is taking this individualism to great heights? We'll talk about more of this in, our, in the nightmare to come. The name of freedom or sovereignty or democracy, Africans have become victims on their own soil. Throughout the continent, the native colonizers at the front line of social fragmentation appear to be an established core of beneficiaries who mobilize a larger body of the dispossessed or marginalized majority into tribalism, partisanship, etc. This is to secure their privileged positions that maintain Africans in neo-slavery status. Every socio-political or economic structure and philosophy or ideology has been western and preached directly or indirectly to ensure the extraction of the natural resources for the benefit of the western socio-political and economic hegemony. This first lecture, or this first talk, is a reflection of the fact that during the advocacy for independence and at, at independence, the Africans had not arrived at informed knowledge. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't go, but what was our independence about? What made a colonially created African nation independent? Was, a, was it a quest for puppet regimes? A return to pre-independence tribal entities, I use the word tribal with quotes, or new Western-inspired form of existence? Was there a clear understanding of colonialism as well as why Europe was in Africa and why and how Africans were designed to collaborate in the agency of their own oppression and exploitation? Certainly, such questions must be answered from an African-centered position. There are lots there are a lot of Africans who behave as if the interests of the West were necessarily identical to African interest, and at the Western point of view, were the one, were the one and only valid one. Please read Ayikoyama. You need to read him. His his, um, his autobiography. You know that he formed. I, I've forgotten the title, but find out and read. Fortunately for our reflections, in 1949. Dr. Danko sent a letter to Dengelfort in which he wrote that Major Astor introduced, to him, introduced him to a Negro lady in England and he had to go to Birmingham to meet her to be properly educated as to the place of the Negro in America in the overall plan for Africa. For a lot of Africans, this is a very haunting paternalistic statement. Now the question is, what was the place of the Negro in a very racist apartheid 19, uh, 1949 America? 75 years later, after the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, after Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Bobby Hutton, Fred Hampton, and Mark Clark, the Negro still shouts that his neck is being stepped on, is being stepped on. What did the US do to African Americans before 1949? At a point, even US laws, US laws made Africans subhuman. So you ask yourself, who are these people? And what is their right to de have designs on Africa? Majestas Negro brings a question of 
Dr. Khalid Muhammad's uh, Abdul Kumar's contention. When white folks can't defeat you, you'll always find some Negro. Some boot-licking, butt-licking, butt-dancing, bamboozles, half-baked, half-fried, that's the way he talks, sissified, punkified, pasteurized, homogenized nigger that they can trot out in front of you. One can only wonder the plans of this Negro, uh, the plans this Negro will educate an African of Dr. Danko Stacher about the role fellow Negroes were to play in U.S.'s post-war plans for Africa. What capacity did the U.S. have to plan for Africa? Who are they? Perhaps after the trauma of slavery and the cultural genocide of colonialism, the Africans were, <laughs> Africans like you, I'm sorry to say, were incapable of thinking and planning for themselves. Think about this deeply. It makes it challenging reflecting on the powers that supported the evil white rule in racist and apartheid South Africa. Who were the countries supporting apartheid South Africa? If you don't know them, then you don't know who your enemies are. Then you don't know what you're doing in this world. Apartheid, South Africa, not too long ago. Mandela was in prison for how long? Some of us know the kind of torture their mindset gave them. Go and read about Diden Kimathi and what they did to him in Kenya. I'm on the Kikuyu. If you are not being taught these in schools, then your education is poor. Who are the people donating arms to UNITA and Jonas Savimbi? as well as support the Portuguese in the slaughter of Africans on, on Africa. Were these the segment of the U.S. plants? I'm not attacking America, per se, but I want you to think. Let us not forget that Africa had its indigenous law and legal framework, governance concepts, forms and structures. Africa fed herself. Africans were not dying of hunger, malnutrition, starvation, and epidemics before Europe came on the scene. If Africa had been caught in starvation and poor health, for example, a lot of identities would have even vanished before colonialism. Further, part of the human resource, which were involuntarily exported to inhumanly sweats for Africa. And you know, whenever we even treat enslavement, one of the mistakes we make as a people is that they were slaves. No, they had heads. They carried knowledge in their head. Knowledge on iron working, knowledge on furniture, a lot of knowledge. They carried these in their head. So much as they had black skins. We tend to, oh, they were slaves. Oh, they, they took slaves. No. They took human beings away. Human beings who had some knowledge. Human beings who had been indoctrinated in a way of life for them to survive in a place. And that is why you found a lot of black inventions in America. And sometimes it's amazing, oh, the black man did this, uh, black man did this, and you sit back because they don't want you to know that you did that. As a matter of fact, Western culture's contact with the African continent has largely been informed by three Ps. It is predatory, parasitic, and psychopathic. I could go on and on. And always know that every culture has its ownership. Those who benefit from a culture are the ones who own the culture. So when you say a culture, you don't expect in the Russians and the Tsar and the, uh, and the Sef to share the same culture. Just as God. My God is different from the oppressor's God. I'm the oppressed. If I pray to the same God, no, my God, you know. So these are things that you need to look at. So is Africa really for Africans? I want to jump a bit so that you don't get tired of hearing my English. Probably Ghana, as the first country, to be in the, as the first space to call itself herself independent in black Africa, it's worth investigating. Read Dr. Danko's description of the various people who attended or were part of the Kuzi committee. Read about Kuzi himself. And Jesus, this is a totally black, very 
very, 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 he's black, all right, but very white. He's whiter than white. And in spite of sitting down with all kinds of people, Kobnasechi and other books, he gave them for them. Let me read the Constitution of Malta. Let me read the Constitution of Liberia. I'm, told, I'm sure that Dr. Fiyajua is looking at Prof. Fiyajua is looking at me. Go and read the, 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 the Constitution of Ceylon, Sri Lanka. He gave, and all of them, you asked us, oh, what has this got to do with indigenous Africa? And Prof. Samun and that has been the basis of our problems up till today. You see, Europe had gone through a history that had led to those forms of nation states. We haven't gone through that history. We didn't have that heritage. What was the heritage? Killing people, assassinations, wars, etc. We tend to forget that. So the psyche of the nation states in Europe is different from us. It, this is not a clean thing. It has a heritage, a heritage of exploitation. Anytime I hear a Ghanaian economist referring to the middle class, I say, yeah, look at Professor. When did we ever become classes? So now we are forcing ourselves to develop classes in our society. But that is them. They went through feudalism. In Russia, the serfs were there and the Tsar was up there. And they killed themselves. They set up programs. 100 years war. You read about, where did we have that? So that is them. <laughs> I'm just reading, well, I don't know how far it's true, a Russian has died, Navalny. The, the, the official narrative from the West says a different thing. And the other narratives, if you go on the, on the, on the, on the net, other narratives from Englishmen that Navani was killed by the British. And then you keep quiet. You think for yourself. In whose interest? So this is the thing, that we came and had independence, so-called independence, throughout Africa. And we followed the white man. What was, what was the white man's history in Africa? And I said it, predatory. Perhaps he just came here to exploit you. So long as he's controlling you, all of you sitting here, oh, democracy. Have you ever defined democracy? Have you ever done it? Prof, you are in political science or something, am I right, or law? Go to Asante, read Rattray. And let him, let Rattray, who comes from a class structured society, tell you what he found in Asante and it amazed him. In 1900, Major Sabadam were referring to the Gold Coast as a republic. And meanwhile, Victoria was the head and they had chiefs and so on. So you need to think the Aborigines' Right Protection Society. So we had dreams. We had dreams. I remember one of the stories, a man who has passed on, uh, I think he was our High Commissioner to Britain, said that in 1949, when the argument in the UGCC came up, my late uncle, who had then become a chief, went to the meeting and addressed it and begged them not to divide. And that is Ghana. And of course, the division. And in fact, he said, Kosyama told me, he says that, he said, if we divide, it will harm this country, that we are not a people of divisions. That division is stupidly going on till today. In whose interest? Obi Yewi, and he belongs to my camp, I cover him. He loses his Ghanaian identity. He loses his African identity. Let's get real. And look for an African way of thinking. We'll get there, I mean, in my last lecture, the authenticity. This is just to provoke you, to make you feel good about yourself. 
you know, I'm sweet talking you. The same way that Prof. Senti sweet talked me in his soft way. But this is the challenge that we have, right? Now, Leopold Senghor made a very interesting, very interesting statement. Uh, time. I wrote it somewhere down here. But the question he asked was very simple. He says, look at all these people demanding independence, demanding this. They don't even know what they're going to do with themselves as governments. Now to end for today. The only priest who was imprisoned because of Ghana's independence struggle. The only priest, he was an Anglican priest. When after an all night meeting, the Gold Coast TUC, especially the Gold Coast Railways, they sat on the, they put pressure on the secretary to sign the declaration of a strike. As soon as, and in fact, <laughs> one of the men there, I don't want to mention his name, from the stories I grew up to hear, took his sandals and over the railway union leader's head. Says, if you don't sign this strike declaration, I'll beat you in front of Nana. So when he said, it was about 4 a.m. They had sat down all night and were tired. And Nkrumah wasn't there. So when he signed, this priest stood up and started singing, lead candy light. So lead candy light, thank you. Give him another round. Where can I start? This is um, a, a reflective lecture full of questions and is the kind of questions that I believe we are supposed to answer for ourselves before we begin to theorize about it. I picked up very important themes and ideas from this talk. One of them is almost um, personal. That is, we hear about the connection of Second D to Dankwa, to independence movement, Grant, and these are really fascinating stories that needs to be told. And I'm, I'm glad that you have brought some of it to our attention for the first time. It's, for you, it's probably common knowledge. For, for many of us, we are hearing for the first time. Um, obviously, um, there are romantic stuff like Mrs. Varden being married to Dr. Dankwa and all of that. And interestingly, it goes right back to second day. Fascinating. Then we come to the hard themes. And I like the analogy that he gave, which is whose ancestor's head sits on your neck? In other words, all of us, we think with ideas that somebody else has put forward or framework that others have done. Then we either extend it or we imbibe it and we live according to that. And uh, our speaker, Nana, is saying that there is no universal or predominant by nature that everybody has, has their own ideas about how the world should be governed or, or organized. And that for some reason, we have tended to think that the European or the Western mind is the standard or the universal and therefore we don't question the foundations or the ideas that are carried through. And he kind of related that to issues of nation state, politics, democracy, the ideas that 
our political scientists tell us, or our lawyers tell us, that these are you know, the rights of this, the fundamentals of this. In other words, he's saying, are these really universal ideas? Or what does Africa have to say about these concepts? And what is the authentic African ideas that could have governed or should govern the way we view politics, law, democracy, and, uh, and economics? I also like a theme that came up, which is, and, and that is for the young people, that the, we tend to think of resources, our gold, and so on. And he says that uh, oil. And we think that if you have that, then somehow you will become rich and develop and build civilizations. And our speaker is telling us that um, it is the mind, what you have inside your mind, how you construct the world, that will determine which, which direction you which direction or goals that you pursue, and that you can have plenty of resources, but if you don't have um, good thoughts about it or, or can't think of how to use it well, then those resources would be, um, would as be exhausted in no time and you can become poorer than when you started out. So that is an idea that I think um, should stay with us, that the biggest resource we have is our human resources and the mind that we have. And that, that, that mind, according to our speaker, that mind should be a mind that, has, uh, that is not controlled by outsiders. That it should be a mind that is focused on what is best for Africa, what, what fits the African reality. And he threw that challenge to the academy. He says, the academy people, you are the brain trust, Think a little bit, think deeply about how you should, how Africa or our ideas should be structured. And I'm, I'm glad that from time to time, we have speakers who bring up these themes. We've heard from uh, our eminent uh, uh, Archbishop Emeritus. He talked about, you know, I think it's his three lectures, he talked about um, African governance, um, you know, African um, politics and how we should create our own society. But I think these ideas come, but we don't really pursue it in a rigorous way or in depth. And therefore, we need to be awakened from time to time by speakers like Nana Kublanketia. Um, then there are some pictures, right? He said, um, you know, the, you think of the map and you see Ghana, Nigeria, I, I, um, Côte, Côte d'Ivoire, Togo, you know, Congo, very large. And um, we take it for granted that it has been that way from time immemorial. But he says that that was done somewhere in Berlin where without the Africans present, some people decided to cut maps and therefore decide that this territory is British and they just draw a map and that's it. And it doesn't matter who the inhabitants are or where they or where their, where their um, civilization extends. So it wants to challenge you to think that the African map you see is a, is a, is a construct and doesn't, it may not correspond to the reality of the people inside that map, right? And he made the example that uh, the ever stretch from Togo all the way to um, Nigeria, and that the Akans have a big proportion of themselves in Côte d'Ivoire, and yet the Akans in Ghana don't know much about the Akans in Côte d'Ivoire, because somebody put uh, a boundary there and said, if, you do, if you're going to go through Elubu, you need a lot of permission to, to go through Elubu to, um, to, to go and see your Akan uh, neighbors in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, so basically he's saying, in the terms of the confused dream, our speaker is saying that we need to understand the history of Africa, history of colonialism, and the, the, the damage that um, has occurred over centuries and how it may have, or how it has shaped the way that we think about the, the world we live in. 
and that that needs to start to, to, to break. And I think we're telling the academy that, you know, here are all these brain trusts and spend a little bit of time thinking about these kinds of issues. Fantastic. Now, um, I don't know about KUSI or KUSI committee, but um, there are a lot of interesting um, historical things that were happening in the, in the pre-independence time and soon after independence. There's a lot of ferment, and somehow I think we have lost that um, you know, intellectual organization, and we've lost that, those ideas of, um, of how do we structure things. Um, last point was, and this is for people who are thinking about stuff, last point was about um, what, what is culture and what makes a culture grow and who benefits from a culture. Those are big questions that, um, you know, the, the nature in which cultural evolution or cultural growth occurs and, the, um, and how we in Africa or Ghana can grow our culture and make it become an essential part of our existence. I want to thank our speaker. It's a very eye-opening and it's very reflective and I'm sure tomorrow we shall hear more about the um, experience in the nightmare. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, all too soon, this is all too soon said actually from the point of view that such an interesting lecture that you could listen on and on and on have to end within an hour. Uh, let's give our president a round of applause for summarizing. Borrowing from the speakers was a multi-dimensional, seven-dimensional, converted into a multi-dimensional concept, talking about history, politics, social studies, and I believe that our young colleagues who are here with us, we are here tomorrow and Wednesday, isn't it? Uh, we have all our subjects more or less covered within uh, this lecture. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to acknowledge the schools present here and um, our dignitaries. We have um, distinguished fellows of the academy and many important people who are here uh, have been acknowledged partially at the beginning of the lecture. We have the Chief Executive Officer of the National Petroleum Authority, uh, Dr. Mustafa Abduhamid, who was here, but I believe has had to go to, had to leave earlier. Um, the schools here, students from Accra Campus, University of Ghana, Accra College of Education, Accra Girls Senior High School, Presbyterian Boys Secondary School, Presec, I believe, Presec Legon, and Accra Academy. Uh, I think we'll give ourselves a round of applause, isn't it? Okay. So we thank you very much for making your presence felt here by your um, attentive listening to the lecture, which has been very invigorating, a breath of fresh air to, yes, I'll leave it like that. And I, as mentioned earlier, I hope that we are all here tomorrow. We are all here Wednesday as we uh, continue to listen to this very thought-provoking talks about our own existence in our nation. 
On this note, I would like to thank you all for making the time to be here this evening. And I'd like to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as uh, our distinguished lecturer and our president uh, leaves the podium, I will kindly re respectfully request that uh, we may all stand up. Uh, there will be refreshment as usual, and uh, you will get directions as to how this may be. Thank you.